Numbers chapter 21 and verse 4. Numbers chapter 21 and then uh, we'll read verse 4. This passage is where the children of Israel are nearing the promised land and they're entering the last phases of their wilderness journey. In the last phases of their wilderness journey, they have constantly complained against the Lord. And in this one incident, the Lord couldn't take it anymore. And he sent fiery serpents to teach them a lesson. Why did the children of Israel complain? Because the route they were taking is not a popular route. It was an unpopular route. It was a complicated route. It was a hard road to take. It wasn't an easy road to take. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. Note this verse. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. I want you to note that. The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, wherefore have ye brought us up out, uh, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Obeth. And they journeyed from Obeth and pitched at Ijea Barim in the wilderness which is before Moab toward the sun rising. From thence they removed and pitched in the valley of Zered. From thence they removed and pitched on the other side of Arnon which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coasts of the Amorites. For Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord what he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon. I want to minister to this church who might liken <clears throat> themselves to the children of Israel in wandering through a route that is not popular. Because of the road, your soul gets discouraged. Your soul gets discouraged because of the way. Because of the way. I would like to minister to this group of people as we are in the Bay Area, as we are in a wicked place, as many of you are going through some circumstances and tough situations. We live in an ungodly environment. I know that coming to this church, it does take work and effort, which I do not take very lightly. A lot of you uh, have to sacrifice time. You have to travel quite a ways. In this hustle and bustle of the city, and the way these roads are built is just ridiculous. The way that this economy and a government and society is formed is just plainly stressful itself. Serving God in this day and age, in this road, is not easy. Many times we might compare ourselves with other churches. We might compare ourselves with other uh, churches and Christians and figure out and suppose that life might be easier if we all just move out of God-forsaken California and then maybe we can live just better lives in a different state inside a different city out there. Maybe we can serve God more easily. It's a struggle to serve Jesus Christ because the school's ungodly, the work's ungodly, the environment's ungodly, your neighbor's ungodly, and on your way to church is just ungodly itself. The road itself that you take, your soul gets discouraged because of the way. Your soul gets discouraged because of the way. I want to minister to this church on why your soul gets discouraged. I know it can be ungodly. I know it can be stressful. And we can suppose a million possibilities of what we could do with our lives to serve God better if we had it this way. This way. Meaning another way to take. 
another road to travel through. But this way we're going through, this way that you're going through right now, is discouraging. Anything but this way. I want to minister to those people. Let's pray. Father, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit? Cleanse away my sins with your blood. I am going to keep preaching the way that you uh, call me to preach. Uh, use it now for your glory, Lord. This is all done for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I want you to see verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. Now notice right here that they had to compass. You see that word? Compass. That means to go around the land of Edom. That's why the people were discouraged because of the way. Let's go back to chapter 20. Why did they have to compass, go around the land of Edom? Notice verse 17. Moses speaks to the children of Edom. Let us pass, I pray thee, I pray thee through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. Verse 21, Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. Notice right here that the children of Israel, they had to go around the land of Edom. They could not pass through the land of Edom. It's an easier way to go through the land of Edom and get to the promised land. Sometimes we can see an easier way where we can get to our destination to serve God as we're traveling home to heaven. But God could have given them that route, but he didn't. He told them instead to just go around. The Edomites won't let you through. Go around. So then the Jews had to turn around, compass the land of Edom, because Edom refused to give Israel passage. And that's why they got discouraged. Because if you picture yourself as the Jews, I mean, can you picture yourself? Your feet are hurting. The sun is so hot outside. And then every time you're traveling, you're like thinking, I could have gotten there already. You're like thinking, I could have reached the promised land by now. You know, I want to serve you, Lord. I want to keep up my spiritual walk, my journey with you. But this road is just too hard to travel. It would have been easier if you'd done this for me, Lord. If I traveled in the land of Edom over there, God. When I traveled over there in the land of Edom, Father, I noticed that the path is easier. Did you notice verse 17? It says, let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the, look at this, in Edom, fields. Look at that, vineyards. Water of the wells. I wonder if, I was those Jews when I'm traveling to, uh, when I'm compassing the land of Edom with those Jews, I wonder how many of them saw those vineyards of Edom as they were walking. And as they kept looking at those vineyards, they're like, man, that sure tastes good. Here am I walking over here. Why am I walking at this route? My soul gets discouraged. Why? Because I keep looking at the vineyard. They look so good. And then, man, where's water to drink? I need some water to drink. And then there's the wells of water right there in Edom. Every time I'm like thinking about water, I look at that well, and I'm like, man, I could have drank, drunk in that by now. Here am I without water to drink, and I'm traveling down this road. And then here you are, the fields of Edom, and man, that looks soft to walk. Look at that. It's, isn't it easier to travel through in that route? But here am I traveling through these rocks. How can I serve God traveling through these rocks? Lord, if you just put me in that field there, boy, I could serve you better. I could travel better for you. You know why their soul got discouraged? Because they saw the vineyards of Edom. Because they saw the fields of Edom. Because they saw their wells of water. My friend, the reason why that your soul gets discouraged along the way is because, see, your eyes are not in this way. Your eyes are looking at those fields of the world out there. 
Your eyes are looking at the vineyards of the wicked one. Your eyes are setting, uh, your eyes are focusing on the wells of water that the liberal Democrats are all drinking up and sucking up. And here you are just crying out for water to drink and they're bleeding you dry. And then here you are like, Lord, this is, why can't I just go over there? Why can't I just join their school system there? Why can't I just join those churches that all those other people are joining those churches? And Lord, why can't I, can I not do it this way? I'll be, it'll be easier to serve you through there. And why can't I just do that, Father? And you're not there with them. You're compassing the land of Edom. And every time you look at their vineyards, the world's vineyards, the world's wells, and the world's fields, that's the reason why your soul gets discouraged along the way. But why God does not give it to you is because of, go to Hebrews 11. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 11. You know, the Bible talks about your Christian journey that, yes, you are wandering. Like those Jews wandering in the wilderness, you're like them. You're not settling in the world, in their fields, in their vineyards, in their wells of water. No, you're just wandering. God recognizes that. And that's why he encourages you as follows. The Bible says in verse 37, they were stoned, Hebrews eleven thirty-seven. they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered, see that? That's you. About in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. <laughs> that sure feels like me, preacher. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Why didn't God give you those fields, those vineyards, the world? I mean, the way you're going along is so discouraging. You're wandering about in dens and caves and mountains. Why is that? Because God prepared a better thing for you. You know why God didn't give you the vineyard? Why God didn't give you the well? Why didn't God give you the field? Because those things are not good enough for you. What's good enough for you that God sees fit is a mansion up in heaven, five crowns, streets paved with pure gold, gold, silver, precious stones, cities to rule on this earth. His riches from on high. He says, yeah, that's what you should get. The world is not worthy of you. That's why. Why didn't he give me this school system? Because it's not worthy of you. Why didn't he give me that kind of a job? Because it's not worthy of you. Why didn't he give me that kind of lifestyle, that comfortable living in the world? It's not worthy of you. They don't deserve you, and you don't deserve them. You should stay away from those things. Those are petty things. Those are vanity. They turn to dust. They're despicable. But God thing had promised something better. Something better. Why would he waste his time? Why would he belittle you by giving you those petty things? Vineyards of Edom. Wells of Edom. No, he promised you something better than that. Those things are not worthy of you. That's the reason why every time you look at that vineyard, God's saying, man, I provided something better for you. Better not look at that. I provide you something way better than that. Oh, if you would only know. Stop looking at that child. That's petty. You don't deserve that. That thing doesn't deserve you. You deserve something better. And I want to give you something better. That verse says, of whom the world was not worthy. Verse 38. Of whom the world was not worthy. So as you, as you get discouraged along the way, and as your eye... Why do you get discouraged? You're looking at something. You're looking at something. It's the vineyard, isn't it? It's the field, isn't it? Those families seem to have it better. Those homes seem to have it better. Even Christians seem to have it better, serve God better in those churches, in those environments. And uh, those brothers and sisters seem to have it better than, you know what you're looking at? Fields, vineyards of the world. Remember this, those things are not worthy of you. And God won't give it to you because he promised you something better than that. Don't stoop yourself so low. Don't stoop yourself so low. God promised you something better. The Bible says, look at this. 39 and 40, God promised these people something better, right? That's why chapter 12, verse 1, this is important. 
Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What witnesses? The ones that were mentioned before. The ones who the world was not worthy. They wandered and they had something better. God says, compass yourself about with those things. Remember numbers? What did the verse say when they went through the land of Edom? Did they went through or did they compass? They compass the land of Edom. As you're compassing the land of Edom, Hebrews 12, 1, compass yourself with a great cloud of witnesses. When you compass the wicked world and your eyes are looking at the wrong things inside Edom, you better compass yourself at the same time with those great cloud of witnesses. Something better, something better, something better, something better. As you look at the godforsaken thing in the world and your soul gets discouraged when you look at that, you better compass, as you compass around that thing, you better compass yourself at the same time with, I got something better than that. I got something better than that. I got something better than you. I got something better than you. I don't want you. That's what you need. No wonder your soul gets discouraged. Because you don't compass yourself with so great a cloud of witnesses of something better. You always compass yourself with something low. Something low. Go back to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. The Bible says at verse 4, And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Okay, that's pretty strong. The verse says that, they were so discouraged that it reached to the very depths of their soul. That really hit them strong to their very, uh, to their very own psyche, so to speak. Their, very, uh, their own real self. It reached to the bottom of their soul and they were so discouraged. Verse 5 kind of shows a little bit of how their soul felt. Notice that they complained at verse 5. Neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Now, can you believe that? That should be, that should be unfathomable. Okay, their soul gets so discouraged. It hits them very hard, and you're like wondering, okay, what would, get you, what would hit you this hard that you'd hit rock bottom to the very depths of your soul? Because my soul hates manna. That doesn't make sense. Bread from heaven? Who would hate bread from heaven from God? If God just dumped out manna from heaven right now, we'd all think we hit the lottery and we'd like to try it. We'd like to taste test it. If that was for lunch today, we'd all line up right now. I mean, who would hate manna? Who would hate God's food from heaven? But they hated it. That does not make sense. The verse shows a strong distaste. It says... Our soul, what? Loatheth. Wow. Loatheth. Notice the language here. There is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth. What does that mean? It sounds like they're saying, there's nothing else out there that I can enjoy except this same old manna. That's what that verse is showing, right? There's nothing else out there I can enjoy to eat except this same old thing. That's the key. The reason why they get sick and tired of manna, if you were in their shoes, is because they couldn't try those garlic, leeks, and onions, and fish from Egypt like their carnal flesh wanted. All they had was manna, God's bread, which is good, but see, they've tried it over and over again. That's like, it's the same old thing. It was good at the beginning, but it's the same old thing. And then there's nothing, there's no variety of options I can try and except the same old thing. That's why their soul got discouraged. You talk about manna from heaven. You got the word of God. I mean, you got the word of God in your hand. Do you realize how many Christians don't have the word of God in their hands at the old days and we have access and we can read it. We got prayer. We got access to God the Father. We got his precious promises. We have salvation, eternal security, a Bible-believing church where a lot of other people don't have Bible-believing churches. And some of you knew what that was like before you came here. You got brothers and sisters in Christ who can pray for you, who can help you out. 
soul winning, the fruits that God has blessed his church that other churches don't get to partake in such fruits. We get a, we get a truckload of blessings. We got hymns. <clears throat> we got three hymn books. We're going to get even more new hymns. Bless God soon. We got good music. We got good preaching. We get great sermons. Yes. We get revival meetings and we get guest preachers. We are spoiled with manna from heaven. Oh, what a blessing. Who would be sick of this? No one would. No other Christian would. You would think no other Christian would. Unless you keep tasting the same old thing over and over. And as you keep tasting that same old thing over and over, your flesh remembers the slavery of Egypt back then. I remember that garlic, leek, and onion, and fish back in Egypt. But sin, the world, the devil enslaved you. They made your life miserable. They beat your back. They spat at you. They didn't care about you. I don't care. My flesh remembers that feeling of that garlic, leek, fish, and onion. It's worth the stripe on my back. It's worth the slavery. And I just want that. What would make you? What would make you go back there? You're tired of the same old thing. You know what the problem is? If you don't learn to park it right there at the same old thing God has given to you, if you don't park it right there, learn to be happy with what you got from God, then that's why your soul will get discouraged along the way. You know why your soul gets discouraged? It wants to get off of the same old thing. It wants something new even if the new thing is going to beat you senseless and make your life miserable and make you pay in the flat. Even if, they are even if they are brutal taskmasters who will beat you senseless, you don't care. You just want that new thing. Unless you learn to find joy in the same old thing God has given to you. And if you learn to settle right there, then you're going to get rest in your soul. Not discouragement in your soul. You're going to get rest in your soul. That's why you get discouraged. You're not, you don't learn to be thankful for what you have. The same old thing. It's good. It's good enough. What more do you want? Just a different flavor. That's your problem. Jeremiah 6. Go to Jeremiah 6. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 6. You know what God's ways is? The old ways. It's always been good. Did you realize the past 2,000 years that it has not changed? His word did not change. You don't need to modernize it. It's still good enough in the year 2023 back then in the year 10 AD. It's always been good, the word of God. You don't need to change church to modernize let's make it upbeat let's you know let's make it rad let's make it cool and no church can be as it is we don't need to change it to modernize it let's change the music the hymns are so old and outdated no they're still good you can find refreshing to your soul you got to learn to be content happy with the same old thing and then what's going to happen is you will remain the happiest person alive but for a person who cannot be happy with the same old thing with the same old thing if a person cannot be happy with that then they will never be happy with anything else in life out there they always seek after something new something new something new something new even if that new thing will beat you senseless look at jeremiah chapter 6 the Bible says in verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways. Oh, that way is so hard. I'm discouraged. My soul is discouraged because of the way. No, you need to stand in that way. And see and ask for the what? Old past. Not new. Old. Where is the good way? That's the good way. My soul is discouraged because of what? The good way? The best way? You don't like it because it's the same old way. That's why. And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. My soul gets discouraged because, of, because you're not asking for the old way. 
until you get your eyes open and say, I want the old way, you will find rest. But an attitude that I don't want the old way, then your soul will get discouraged because of the old way. The old way. You got to learn to make that old way, uh, you got to learn to make that old way refreshing to you. You got to learn to make that old way joyous to you. You got to learn to make that old way something that's a keeper for life. But to, if you'll never do that, then I guarantee you this, your soul will be discouraged because of the way. Go back to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Verse 5. Verse 5. The Bible says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Okay. So because their soul gets discouraged along the way, the first people that they blame and they get upset is those Edomites. How dare they make us make a U-turn and, boy, I want to get even with them. No. It's not the Edomites. It's, well, the last person you would think to blame. What? My mama, my daddy, you know, my best friend. No, God. Are they nuts? Are they stupid? What in the world? And against Moses. <laughs> Come on, man. This poor helpless guy was just leading you, helping you out. You would think all the common sense in the world will lead you to think that when you read that passage at verse 5, the people would speak against the Edomites. It would be the king of Edom. It would be those Edomite soldiers. Those people from Edom keep mocking us. They keep pushing us away. They keep showing off their vineyards and their wells, make our lives miserable. The people should speak against them. Why would they? First thing they would speak against is God and Moses. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The reason why they did, because it was convenient. It was easy for them. You can't mock. You can't get angry at the Edomites because they don't care about you. Because they'll still poke fun at you. They'll criticize you. But it's sure easy to get upset at God because he cares. You know, a lot of times when your soul gets very discouraged because of the way, you don't get upset at the devil. When he, he should be the one that's making your life hell on earth. You should be, the first person you get upset is the devil. The first person you get upset is the world. The very first person you'd get upset is your flesh. Surprisingly, the flesh is the last person we get upset at. We cherish the flesh and think the flesh did nothing wrong. When the flesh is the biggest traitor of them all. Boy, I hate this stinking flesh. But no, 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 no. We, wouldn't, we don't get upset at them. We blame God. We get upset at God. And you would go, why, why in your right mind would you get upset at God? You know why? It's easy to get upset at him. It's more convenient to. Because your flesh don't care, the world don't care, the devil don't care. But God cares. And because God cares, that's why it's easy to lash out at him. Hey, let me open your eyes more. It's not just God, it's against Moses. You know what happens when your soul gets very discouraged? Listen, if you're not careful, when your soul gets discouraged along the way, the first people you get upset with is not the devil, it's not the wicked lost world, God forsaken sinners. It would be not even your friends. It would be the closest friend, the closest brother and sister in Christ that you rely heavily upon. It would be your husband, it would be your wife, it would be your son, it would be your daughter, it would be at the church member sitting right next to you. It would be at the pastor. Those are the first people you lash out. You might say, why? That don't make sense. You know why? Because they're the easiest to lash out against. Because they're the closest to you. 
the ones that you're closest to, most comfortable with, you lash out. How many times have you lost your testimony? At home, at church, in the workplace, outside, in your private, safe space, where you thought nobody would see. And then the ugly parts came out because you're in your comfort zone, and in the comfort zone, the true colors of yourself are exposed. And then you lash out at the person you're most comfortable, you're most close to. That's what happens when your soul gets discouraged along the way. Is that if you're not careful, you're going to lash out at, the someone, at someone you're closest to who you greatly love. That's why people can easily lash out against God. The very last person you'd lash out against. Why? He's the easiest because he's closest to you. He loves you the most. Be careful when your soul gets discouraged along the way. Notice the next part of the verse. It says, verse 5, Wherefore have he brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Don't get dramatic. Don't get dramatic. Why have you brought us out in the wilderness to die? Come on, man. How many times has God provided miracle? Pulled you through. Why would you say something like that? You know, what happens? Why would they say that we're going to die? We're going to die. Maybe because someone did die. Maybe because they saw someone die. Because of the way. Let's go back. Numbers. Let's go back to Numbers. All right, remember Numbers 20, 21? That's where it started, right? Numbers 20, 21. Edom did not give them passage, right? Okay, so he, thus begins their journey of the discouraging way. They're compassing the land of Edom. What happens? Somebody dies. Look at verse 22. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because he rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Notice right here that verse 28, And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them upon Eliezer his son, and Aaron died there in the top of the mount. And Moses and Eliezer came down from the mount. Note verse 29. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead. Look at that. Those Jews, when they were compassing the land of Edom, they saw someone die along the way. That was Aaron. When they saw Aaron die because of the way, if your soul gets discouraged, wonder what you would do if you were the Jews. Oh, I hate this road. This is so hard. And oh my, are you kidding me? Aaron? Aaron, the one second in charge of the whole church, die because of this road we're taking? Oh my goodness, if he died, I wonder what's going to happen to... Oh, I'm so scared. Why did Pastor Moses say that we have to go through this route? And, I mean, his assistant pastor died along the way, and he thinks that we're going to survive along this route, and we can go through. He's got to be crazy. And they got scared. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You know what happens? Why our soul gets discouraged along the way? What happens is, you're not dead. That's ridiculous. You're still alive. God's blessing you. You're okay, but then you see somebody else's misfortune, somebody else's death along the way. And when you see that, you associate your pain with that person's pain. You associate your death with that person's death. And then when you see that person die because of that hard road taken, you're like, if it happens to them, it's going to happen to... And then you go... Oh my, this is the assistant pastor, the second person in charge of the whole church who died along the way. If that person goes through that, it's going to happen to me. And, and you get scared. You panic. 
You know why your soul gets discouraged along the way? You're looking at somebody else that you know, you saw, you got traumatized. You remember at the back of your history, someone who died along the road that you know is the right road for the Lord. And then because of that, it became a horrible thing that you kept in your mind. And then pretty soon in your life, unconsciously, it comes out and you go, oh, I'm going to die too. Hey, you're not going to die. In Aaron's case, you don't, there's a good reason why he died. A good reason. God doesn't do things unreasonably. You know why Aaron died? He sinned against God. He rebelled. You know what our problem is? Our problem is, is that when we look at somebody who died along the way, we don't know the good reason what God's putting them through. I don't know what it is. Reaping what you sow, he has a better purpose and plan. Maybe they could bear it. I don't know. But God has a good reason, and you don't need to know about it. Congregation didn't even need to know about it, but, they tri but Aaron died. All they had to do was trust in God. They didn't have to dramatize. We're going to die in the wilderness. You're not dead yet. Here you are. You're blessed by God. God protected you. He pulled you through. He did miracle after miracle, hasn't he? Why are you discouraged then? You know why? You look at somebody else who died along the way. And you associate their death with your death. And then you go, if it happens to them, it's going to happen to me. And I just know it. And that's why your soul gets discouraged along the way. You need to get out of that. Get out of that. And realize God has a good reason for what that person is going through. And you need to focus on your walk with Jesus Christ, not somebody else's walk. Aren't you worried enough with your walk with Jesus Christ? Then why are you looking at somebody else's walk? I'll tell you what, as a Bible-believing pastor, with all the members that I got and then the people that I, that I contact with online, if I got involved with everybody else's walk in their lives, I would be the most suicide, I would have committed suicide a hundred times already. You know what would keep me sane? Focus on my own walk. Well, you know what would keep me sane? Let God take care of their walk. Focus on your walk, Gene. If I associate everybody's problems and put them in mine, I'm going to go, oh my goodness, it's going to happen to me too. And then I would have committed suicide a hundred times already. What keeps me going and serving God is I need to focus on my own walk with Jesus Christ. My own problems in life. All the other people's walks and problems. God is in control. God can handle it. And he won't get a stressful day out of that. Because he's God. And I'm not. You can't play God and put other people's problems on yourselves. Focus on your walk with Jesus Christ. Why are you discouraged along the way? Because you saw somebody who died along the way? Let's go to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21. Notice in verse 6. Numbers 21 verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Problem solved. They, they stopped whining now. That solved their discouragement problem. You talk about something that will get a person's heart and attitude right with God. Oh Lord, why is it you're so awful and why did this bad thing happen? And then God's, God said, you know what, I'm going to send you a fiery serpent. And then just bit their tails and then they're like, oh, I get right with you. I'm encouraged in the Lord. And God's like, about time. <laughs> now that's a horrible way to explain it. Wouldn't it have been better if it was through God's mercy they got right with God. Wouldn't it be better with God's love they gotten right with God? God's patience they got right with God? It had to take something fiery to stop their discouragement. Sad. You know what's really sad? As much as we would like God's patience to get us right with God, God's understanding to help us to stay encouraged in the Lord, God's love and care to help us stop whining, it's really sad that it still doesn't. And it has to take something 
fiery from God to finally open up your eyes and quit your whining, quit your complaining, quit your discouragement, and stay encouraged in the Lord. I'm pretty sure some of you are witnesses of that. Unless I'm the only one, I must be backslidden more than all of you. Isn't that sad? Let me give an example of something fiery. Fiery trial. Sometimes it takes a fiery trial. When we go through that, we mature. And our understanding opens. And then we go, okay, Lord, uh, I realize that I was spoiled. I was too immature. I was too, uh, I relied too much on my flesh. I got to trust in you that you're real. Your power is real. Your answers to prayers are real. That you're an all-powerful God and miracles can still happen upon my life. And you provide my needs. But sometimes a fiery trial wakes the senses out of you. And it gets you out of your stupefied phase of discouragement. And you finally get your strength together and then get your senses together and just move on for the Lord. Why? Because God has to send a fiery trial to mature you finally. Amen. How many of you are witnesses of that? Yeah. Uh, let me give another example. Something fiery. Maybe his chastisement. You know, the Bible says that his wrath, his anger, is pictured as fire. Thank God that we don't go through his fiery wrath, but we go through his chastisement. Sometimes, it's not a, uh, if not a fiery trial, the Lord has to sometimes beat it out of your head, right? That never happened to any of you, I'm sure. When you get discouraged and you whine and you're like, oh God, I don't take it, and then God just beats you senseless, bam, with the chastising rod, and you go, oh, I get it, I'm sorry, Lord. Maybe it was from a rebuke. Maybe it was from a preaching. Well, let me tell you something worse than that. Maybe it was the Lord one-on-one with you, right? And he hit you on the rear end, and then you woke up, and you go, oh, my goodness, I was so spoiled and rotten. And Sometimes the Lord, he can be so patient with us after 6,000 years of human history and go, child, do you realize that everybody goes through a hard time and not just you? <clears throat> How long do I have to put up with it? Okay, fine, I'll have to beat it out of you. Oh, how, how long? And then bam, and then you go, oh! And then you wake up, and you go, oh. And then you quit whining, and God's like, oh, problem solved. Why didn't I do that a long time ago? That's true. Sometimes it takes a fiery chastisement to get us to open our eyes, right? Yeah. Let me tell you something worse than that. You might go, how much worse can it get, Pastor? There's one thing I'm thankful for is that I don't have to face the fire of hell. Amen? That's, at least I don't have to go through that worst thing. But there's a fire called the judgment seat of Christ. And if God don't put you through a fiery trial to stop your discouragement, to stop your problem, if God won't send a fiery chastisement to open your eyes and get your senses straight, I guarantee every single one of you through the fire of the judgment seat of Christ, when you come in with your, comp your best complaint and excuses why you couldn't serve God, why your soul got discouraged along the way, the fire of the judgment seat of Christ will shut all your mouths because God is justified at the judgment and you're wrong. And as you come out with your best excuses, you get stupefied. You get condemned and you feel guilty. And you go, oh, the shame. And the fiery judgment seat of Christ opens your eyes and you cry with tears and you go, why couldn't I see it? Why did my soul get discouraged along the way and I stop? And then guess what? It's too late. You can't go back in the way. That'd be the worst fiery thing for you to go through is the judgment seat of Christ. My friend, does the Lord have to send something fiery to finally get your soul out of that discouragement phase? To get you to stay faithful in the way, even though it's not the easy way? Does the Lord have to send something fiery 
God forbid the fiery thing would be at the end if you never get right with God. The fiery thing will be at the judgment seat of Christ at the end. That would be the worst. But then it's too late. You can't get back on the way. Look at verse 7. Oh, you talk about great awakening revival, right? They stop getting discouraged. Look at this, verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, when he looks at that serpent on a pole, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. You know, you talk about revival. They stopped getting discouraged. They got right with God. They repented. And as a matter of fact, as soon as they saw that serpent on a pole and they got healed of their serpent bites, you know what happened? I could be wrong, but I never read an account after this incident where the Jews got discouraged along the way and complained ever again. Sure, we can see them messing up with the Moabites later on, for example, or other problems, but their sin of whining and complaining, listen up, their sin of whining and complaining has been their perpetual problem. Do you remember that? In their 40 years of wandering? That has been their perpetual problem. After looking on the serpent on the pole, Never again after that. After they looked at that serpent on a pole, all of a sudden, like magic, they never whined and complained again after that. You know who that serpent on the pole is? Jesus Christ at John chapter 3. Jesus Christ said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus Christ says, I picture that serpent on the pole. I wonder how many of us, if we look at Jesus Christ high and lifted up on the cross, we will never, ever complain again. Amen. We will never, ever have our souls discouraged along the way again. That verse I repeated so many times, you know what I'm going to say. Can you guess? Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What did the very next verse say after that? You got to look at that lest he be weary and faint in your minds. If you don't look at Jesus Christ, his example on the cross, verse says you will be discouraged along the way. You'll get weary. Did you look at Jesus Christ? You won't complain again. You won't get discouraged. Did you look at Jesus Christ? Well, pastor, I looked at Jesus Christ and then I still find problems. And No, 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 no. Did you really get a good look at him? Well, I looked and no, I never said a skim. I said, look, look. Well, I had a glimpse and no, no, not a glimpse. Look, look. Did you really look? Did you really look? Did you really look at his nail-scarred hands? Did you really look at his back ripped open by and shredded by whips? Did you look at his head with gushed with a crown of thorns? Did you really look into those eyes bleeding red for you? His beard plucked out. His cry, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Did you really look at that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Did you really look at that verse in Isaiah 53? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with the stripes we are healed. Did you get a good look? Did you look at Calvary? Did you look at his dying visage? Did you really look at Jesus Christ? Did you ever visit Calvary? Did you really look at Jesus Christ? No, you didn't look at him. I, if you think you did get a good look at him, no. 
There's a difference with you and the first century Christians. You know what the difference is? First century Christians were able to put up with a lot of persecution and hardship more than you and I did. You, all, you and I know that. Torn apart by lions, burned alive, children were even tossed to the Colosseums. You know why they were not weary? They kept being fired up. You know why? They saw firsthand their Savior who died on the cross. You didn't. See, you didn't really take a good look at Calvary. Picture yourself. Go back. Look at Calvary. Stay there. Keep looking. You know the Jews, when they looked at that serpent on the pole, they didn't just go one eye and like that. But that's what you do during your troubles. With troubles going around, you just look at it one eye, Jesus Christ bleeding, and then like that. And then you concentrate on all that pain, all that problems. It's just a blink point one second and that's it. You don't immerse yourself. Look at Jesus Christ at Calvary. Carry that pain with you when you go to Calvary. And as Jesus Christ yelps and screams and he is torn apart, bleeding all over the ground, I dare you to carry that pain with you to Calvary and see how much you win against Jesus Christ. You didn't really look unto Jesus. Now when we look back right here at verse 10, the Bible says, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Oboth. And they journeyed from Oboth and pitched at Igea Barren, in the wilderness which is before Moab toward the sun rising. From thence they removed and pitched in the valley of Zered. From thence they removed and pitched on the other side of Arnon, which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coast of the Amorites. For Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon, and at the stream of the brooks that goeth down to the dwelling of Ar, and lieth upon the border of Moab. And from thence they went to Beer, that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gathered the people together, and I will give them water. Now, <clears throat> notice from 10 through 15, nothing special, nothing spectacular. Same old, same old, they just wander. Notice right here, they just went forward, pitched in Hobeth, and they journeyed, and then they pitched at Ijeabarim, and they wandered again, and then, at, then they pitched in the valley of Zered, and same old, same old. But this time, no account of them whining, complaining, or being discouraged. Just faithfully, faithfully, the same old way, pitching, cleaning, traveling, pitching, cleaning, traveling. Pitching, cleaning, traveling, compassing the land of Edom, going past those vineyards, going around the fields, the wells of water. And you know what? They don't, they don't look at that anymore. They just look at the road and they so pitch, tent, sleep, pick up, let's go. Pitch the tent again, pick up, sleep, let's go. Carry the tent, pitch, sleep, pick up, let's go. Compassing the land of Edom. Faithful day in, day out not a peep of discouragement or weariness, just complete faithfulness. No whining, no complaining. How much do we need that ourselves? Compass the land of Edom, and it's the same old thing, friend. Wake up, some of you, you know, you have to wake up at seven-ish, some of you six-ish, God forbid, some of you five-ish. Get ready for church, drive those long miles, get to church, fellowship with the brethren, sing some hymns, hear some preaching, go back home, read the Bible, pray, 
Get to work, stay away from sin, stay away from Edom, stay away from those vineyards, those well, just compassing and then just marching with your tent and then you're wandering, wandering with your tent, you pitch it here, you pick it up and clean it and then carry it along again and then here comes Wednesday, here we go, street preaching, here comes Monday, you go street preaching, Tuesday, you go tracking, here we go with the Zoom meeting, the ladies, they meet together Thursday, the young adults, that Friday, Saturday, and then you just pitch your tent and pick it up, and here comes Sunday carrying in, and here goes Edom screaming out at you, you're just not looking at it, you're ignoring, faithful day in, day out, pastor's gone on a trip, and you say, no, I'm not going to bail out on this one, I'm going to keep pitching my tent, picking it up, dragging it, I'm not going to bail out, I'm going to stay faithful, consistent. Pastor don't need to follow up. Member so-and-so don't need to follow up. You just pick up your tent and pitch it and clean it. March along, carry your tent. Stay faithful in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. You stay faithful. Faithful. In and out. Not weary. Not discouraged. Not weary, not discouraged. Let's go to Galatians 6. Galatians 6. We all know this verse. You know? I can say all these things about being faithful, staying consistent, and we know that, and we got to keep trying it. I wonder, though, the reason why we get discouraged and weary, maybe, my friend, it's not because of the vineyards in Edom. I wonder, brethren, if it's not because of the rough road you're traveling that's a long road, a hard road. Maybe that's not why you're weary. Maybe that's not the real reason. Maybe the real reason why you're being weary is not because someone died along the way. Maybe it's not because of that. Maybe those are just your excuses, but that's not the real reason. I wonder if the real reason you get weary in your day in, day out traveling the road is because you think that what you're doing is not really well enough. You think too little of what you're doing. I wonder if that's the reason. You don't think this is a spectacular thing, a good enough job. I mean, if I were to, if you had a job opportunity where the whole world would think it's very important, spectacular job, an important job, that would probably save the whole world, you'd probably take that job seriously and do it because you know it's a very important job. But these things are so little, aren't they? These things people don't give you credit for, right? These are things that people don't pay attention to. These are things that people take your work for granted. These are things that don't mean too much to you. Maybe that's why you get weary day in, day out. Because you don't think it's a well enough or a good enough job that you're doing. It's not like when you do this job, people are going to pay you $100 per hour. It's not like when you do this job, people are going to pat you on the back and say, oh man, uh, you just saved the whole world, thank you. It's not like when you go out street preaching, people are going to uh, say thank you all the time. It's not like when you invite people to church, people are going to just say, oh, I can't wait to go to your church, thank you for inviting me. It's not like when you witness to people, people are going to go, man, I want to accept Jesus Christ. If it weren't for you, thank you so much. No, they, they close the door on you. They think you're stupid. 
They toss the track you give to them. It's not like when you get your whole family to serve God together that the families are going to thank you and then you know, say, what a wonderful person you are. Well, it's, uh, it's a job that you don't think it's well done enough. You think too little of it. No one compliments you. No one thinks it's important. And you got to thinking about that. And you think that those things that you're doing, track passing, reading the Bible, getting to church, helping the brother and sisters in Christ, you think they're too little. You think too little of them. You know, this verse says this, so that you don't get weary. It's a famous verse, but I never saw it this way before. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It's a famous verse. Don't get weary. Keep on working for Jesus Christ because the due season, you're going to reap the reward. You're going to get it. And praise the Lord, we are going to get it. God's going to have us reap the goods. But here's the thing is that we haven't paid attention to that verse. Look at that verse. It's true in due season, you're going to get it. But why you shouldn't be weary is because verse 9 says, and let us not be weary in what? Well doing. You know what God says about what you're doing now? It's well enough. It's a good job. You have no idea, my friend. When you showed up to visitation and no one's around and then you're about to go out, win souls for Jesus, and the rain came down and then you're like, oh, I just wasted my time, that God says, man, you accomplished your job. Well done. Thank you. You've done well. Good job. Thank you. You've got no idea when you brought the food and then helped out to feed God's children that God says, good job, child. You have no idea when you resisted the sin and the world and the flesh and sacrificed to follow Jesus Christ that God said, I'm proud of you. You don't realize what you're doing is well. I think the encouragement that you and I want to receive more than any other at the judgment seat of Christ is not the gold, silver, precious stones or the crowns. I would dare say the thing that we want the most at the judgment seat of Christ is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Right? If that's the thing you wanted the most in your life, don't you realize God is telling you right now, well done? Because you're doing well. Well doing well done. Amen. That's good, preacher. Yeah. <laughs> the thing you wanted the most. The thing you wanted the most you got. <laughs> if only we would not be weary in that. That's right. If only we would not get out of the way. Yeah. But we allowed the devil, the flesh, the world to blind us. To make us think we're not doing well. And we got out of the way. And we fear more of the terror of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ rather than anticipating well done from him. Maybe that's why you're weary. It's because you don't know that God says well done to you. You don't have to wait at the judgment seat of Christ for him to say well done. Why not come on the altar and let him speak to you? Well done. Every head bow and every eye shut.